Before there was Ellen Ripley. Before there was Wonder Woman. There was the original action heroine, Atalanta. Now available at Amazon, Smashwords, and at studiobrainstorm.net. Links in the description. It is often said that one in every million humans born within the Imperium of Man, one of them is a Psyker, though that ratio is slowly changing, as with each passing year, more and more individuals are born with psychic talent, in spite of the ruthless efforts of the Inquisition and the Ecclesiarchy's mandated prejudice against the Witch. But if one in every million human beings is a Psyker, one in every billion human births is a blank. Like psychers, a person's status as a blank is determined by genes, specifically the so-called pariah gene. If you are one of those very, very rare individuals born with this particular genetic trait, then you are possessed of a talent almost unheard of in the 40k universe, this universe where demons themselves can tear through the fabric of reality and wreak havoc upon the hapless population of the galaxy. Total immunity to the warp. To be a blank in 40k means that the immaterium, that no space where anything and everything can happen, has no effect on you whatsoever. In your presence, the powers of psychers fizzle out. Demons are unable to stand you. At best, they find your mere presence agonizingly painful. At worst, you could potentially banish them back to the warp by simply standing next to them. Given the religiously mandated hatred for psychers and anything warp-related among the Imperial citizenry, you could be forgiven for thinking that blanks are appreciated and celebrated by the Imperium. You could be forgiven for it, but then you'd be forgetting what kind of universe this is. Unfortunately, being immune to psychers and being able to stare down demons comes with a price. And that price is, you don't have to be touched by the warp to find blanks disturbing. Ignoring all the metaphysical arguments about whether or not souls exist in our reality, in Warhammer 40k, they most certainly do, and they have a specific nature. With the exception of the Necrons post-biotransference, all sentient beings in the Warhammer universe have souls, and the soul in 40k manifests as a reflection in the warp. The best way I can sum it up is that it's like the manifestation of a person's presence or life energy in the immaterium. And generally, if you're psychically gifted, you have a much stronger presence in the warp. The stronger the psyker, the stronger the presence. Even the Tau, who at this point have no psychers, ethereal conspiracy theories notwithstanding, have a presence in the warp, just a very, very weak one. Blanks don't even have that much, and people, psychic or otherwise, can sense that. This quote-unquote soullessness of the blank gives him a very disconcerting and discomforting aura, for lack of a better term. For a non-psyker, the presence of a blank makes them feel incredibly uncomfortable, sometimes to the point of being ill. And of course, since knowledge of blanks, like so many other things, is kept from the public by the Inquisition, most people don't know how to handle a blank, and so often react to this feeling of uncomfortableness that they carry around with them with violence and fear. People fear and hate blanks without knowing or even understanding why they fear and hate them. Many infants born with the pariah gene die either of neglect or are killed by their parents who simply can't stand being around them. If somehow a pariah does survive childhood, their life is a very grim and solitary one, appropriate for the 41st millennium. However, no matter how much people hate blanks, much like the psychers, blanks are very useful to the Imperium of Man, especially with their unique warp nullifying abilities. And so, ever since the days when the Emperor still walked among his people, the Imperium of Man has found several uses for those born with the pariah gene. The Officio Assassinorum has an entire temple dedicated to the training of blanks. The Inquisition is another imperial institution that has made extensive use of blanks over the centuries. One famous example being the Distaff, a group of blanks set up by Inquisitor Gregor Eisenhorn in the early 41st millennium. 
By Eisenhorn's later career, the DIS staff totaled 40 members in all. And in fact, Eisenhorn often would loan out members of the DIS staff to his fellow inquisitors as needed and requested. But of course, the most prominent example of imperial use of blanks is the so-called Anathema Sicana, the Sisters of Silence. The exact origins of the Sisters of Silence are, perhaps unsurprisingly, shrouded in mystery. At this point, there are two known potential origin stories. The first version is rather simple and straightforward. The Order of the Anathema Sicana was created early on in the Great Crusade as a militant arm of the Divisio Astrotelepathica, the precursor to the Adeptus Astrotelepathica. With the Emperor, in his wisdom, having anticipated the potential uses and applications of blanks in dealing with any psychic threat to the nascent Imperium of Man. In a way, the Sisters of Silence relationship with the Astrotelepathica anticipates the relationship the Adeptus Sororitas would have with the Adeptus Ministorum following the Reign of Blood, and Sebastian Thor exploiting that little no-men-under-arms loophole in the decree passive. The other origin of the Sisters of Silence also took place in the early Great Crusade, but instead of being the result of the Emperor's foresight, was the result of a combination of happy accident and desperate necessity. One fine day in millennia 30, the hive world of Pentecanes, a planet uncomfortably close to Terra, experienced a major revolt, led by a psyker doomsday cult known as the Final Banquet. Initial efforts made by the Imperial Army and the Divisio Astrotelepathica unfortunately failed to pacify the situation, and soon enough, the final banquet ran riot across the planet, with its psychic leaders unleashing all kinds of warp shenanigans on the hapless populace and the Imperial defenders. As fate would have it, the Divisio Astrotelepathica contingent included a small fleet of black ships, those grim vessels used to transport psychers back to Terra for processing and evaluation. And the commander of this small fleet, one Gigandantes, noticed that amidst the figurative chaos engulfing the hive world, there was one small stable pocket of resistance. This resistance seemed to be centered around a single regiment of the Imperial Army, an all-female unit officially identified as the 5th 913 Indentured Irregulars, and more informally called the Daughters of the Crow. Dantes, being a member of the Astrotelepathica, and thus a man who knew his psychic phenomena all too well, quickly reached the obvious conclusion that the women of the Daughters of the Crow were blanks. Dantes immediately threw his full support behind the Daughters of the Crow and made them the nucleus of a major Imperial counteroffensive against the Final Banquet, using the Daughters to specifically target the cult's psychic leaders. Final pacification was achieved thanks to an intervention of Space Marines from the 6th Legion Space Wolves, but the Daughters of the Crow had proven the effectiveness of their uncanny abilities. The story goes that after the pacification was achieved, the Daughters of the Crow boarded Dante's ships and were never heard from again. Whichever origin story you choose to believe, the Sisters of Silence were a mainstay of the Imperium during the Great Crusade, particularly in dealing with psychic threats. Although officially part of the Divisio Astrotelepathica, the Sisters of Silence very quickly became associated with the Emperor personally and his custodian guard. Ultimate proof of this is the fact that even after the Emperor's internment upon the Golden Throne, the Sisters of Silence were granted full run of the Imperial Palace, something that no other beings apart from the Custodians have. Given this obvious privilege of proximity to the Emperor, the Sisters of Silence were, and to some extent are in the modern 40k universe, equipped with some of the best military hardware the Imperium can come up with surpassed only by the Custodians and certain high-ranking members of the Mechanicus. There are, however, a few artifacts unique to the Sisters that set them apart from, say, the Sororitas, the Space Marines, or even the Custodians. The first is their distinctive Vratine armor, said to be among the strongest in the Imperium, surpassed only by the Oromite war gear of the Custodians. Its only real drawback is the fact that, for some reason, Vratine armor is not environmentally sealed, meaning that unlike the power armor of a space marine, Vratine armor is ineffective in the void. The second is their iconic signature weapon, the Executioner Great Blade. Massive two-handed power swords with diamond-edged blades, meaning that even with the power field off, 
a great blade can pierce the finest armor. Such high quality war gear, unsurprisingly, is not given lightly. And while the exact methods by which the Sisters of Silence train their acolytes are unknown, they are generally assumed to be excruciatingly difficult, like most training regimens in the Imperium of Man. All that is known is that if a novice is deemed worthy, the moment her training is completed, she is given her set of Ratine armor and recites the Oath of Tranquility, the last words she will ever speak. The exact words of the Oath of Tranquility are unknown, but it is, in effect, a vow of silence. This is what gives the sisters their name, and why one of the distinctive features of Ratine armor are exaggerated lower face masks, often stylized to resemble fortress gates, sealing away the voice of the sister from the universe at large. But even mutes need to be able to communicate, if only with one another. Among themselves, the Sisters of Silence communicate by use of a sign language called Thoughtmark. This is used for both casual conversation and for the conveyance of complex ideas. Whereas in combat situations where brevity takes precedence over everything else, the Sisters resort to Battlemark, another sign language used to convey orders and commands as quickly as possible. When required to use Vox communication, the Sisters use Morse code, or as it's called in the 41st millennium, Orse code. The downside to all this, though, is that it makes it hard for the Sisters of Silence to work in tandem with other Imperial combat units. And that's without factoring the Sisters' pariah gene and the fact that it makes other people unable to stand them. Even transhumans like the Astartes and the Tech Priests of the Mechanicus have a hard time not being uncomfortable in the presence of blanks though they do their best not to show it. The one great exception to this are the Custodians. As a general rule, they are not only fluent in all three languages employed by the Sisterhood, but they also seem to be the only beings in the Imperium immune to the uncomfortable presence of blanks. From the moment the Oath of Tranquility is taken, the new Sister of Silence is referred to as a Null Maiden, essentially a line soldier within the organization of the Sisterhood. Like Space Marines, Null Maidens are organized into squads, usually one of three specializations that are roughly equivalent to the Space Marine Tactical Assault and Devastator variants. Seeker squads use close firearms like flamers, the prosecutors are long-range specialists, while melee combat is left to the vigilators and their distinctive greatswords. Multiple squads are organized into cadres of about a hundred, so roughly the same numbers of a space marine company, and the cadres are in turn organized into thousand-woman vigils, the equivalent of a space marine chapter. That said, the purpose of the Sisters of Silence is not so much warfare like the space marines, but specifically the hunting down of psychers. As such, vigils or any larger formations are rare. Usually the largest unit of sisters commonly encountered is the cadre. As such, each cadre has its own identity, color scheme, and even its own distinct designation. Squads of rank-and-file Null Maidens are led by sisters' superiors. From there, the command structure of the Sisters of Silence gets a little hard to quantify as there is so little information about them. All I've been able to find out is that above the sisters' superiors there are the Oblivion Knights, which are generally veterans. Above them, in turn, are cadre-level commanders, the Knight Centura or the Knight Abyssal. From there, the Sisters of Silence are organized into two different institutions, known as Chambers. First is the Chamber of Oblivion, which deals with military and battlefield affairs, and under which most Sisters of Silence are organized. But then there is the Chamber of Judgment. Sisters from this chamber are known as Excruciatus, and they function as kind of a secret police of the Silent Sisterhood, almost like Inquisitors in a way. Their primary role is to hunt down and find not just psychers, but those who would harbor and shelter them from Imperial law. The Excruciatus are often known to hold themselves apart from their fellow sisters in the Chamber of Oblivion. Even their rank designations are distinct. Instead of Null Maidens, rank and file Excruciatus are known as Questora, and their squad commanders are dubbed Silent Judges. Also, while the cadres of the Chamber of Oblivion each have their own distinct heraldry and look, all Excruciatus wear the same red armor and have ruby implants in their eyes. 
One particularly disquieting rumor regarding the Excruciatus is that in order for an ordinary Questora to become a silent judge, she has to oversee personally the burning of 100 witches in the course of her career. Ruling over these two chambers of sisters are three commanding officers. The Sister Commander or Knight Commander, the Mistress of the Black Fleet, and the Nemesis Praxia. The Knight Commander is the overall leader of the Sisters of Silence, as well as the commander in terms of military affairs. The Nemesis Praxia is the chief lore keeper, recording the history of the Sisters of Silence from the organization overall to its individual units, and is also responsible for training recruits. Finally, the Mistress of the Black Fleet, as her name implies, is in command of all Sisters of Silence cadres stationed aboard the Black Ships. Which makes sense. After all, even if all psychers aboard Black Ships are doped to the gills, clapped in phase iron, and stuck in containers meant to dampen their powers, you can never be too careful when it comes to warp shenanigans. And what better way to stop your cargo of psychers from going nuts than having them be guarded by women whose very presence made them want to claw their own eyes out? In these capacities, as guardians of the Black Ships and witch hunters par excellence, the Sisters of Silence would serve the Imperium throughout the Great Crusade and into the Horus Heresy. Their fighting prowess and their unique blank abilities proved crucial in such conflicts as the war within the Webway, the burning of Prospero, and of course the Siege of Terra. And they would continue to do so after the Heresy had ended and the Emperor was interred upon the Golden Throne. But, in large part because of their pariah genes, the sisters always lived apart and aloof from humanity, operating out of their moon-based fortress, the Somnus Citadel. Alas, the minds of men are ever quick to forget, and no amount of loyal service to the Imperium or prowess against the witch could counteract the irrational animosity that the mere presence of the sisters engendered in baseline humanity. As such, the 10,000 years between the Horus Heresy and the Era Indomitus has been something of a vicious cycle for the Silent Sisterhood. There are only two known instances of this happening, but given that 10,000 years is a long time, I would wager hard money that this has happened more than once. The cycle goes something like this. The Sisters of Silence do their duty and serve the Imperium for some time, let's say a few centuries or so. Then, for one reason or another, the ever-intolerant and short-sighted Imperium would begin persecuting its soulless defenders, eventually driving the sisters from the Sol system and forcing them into hiding. A few more centuries pass, then some great, usually psychic-related threat looms, and representatives of the Imperium have to track down the sisters and go hat in hand, begging them to return to serve the Golden Throne. The sisters ultimately do so and serve faithfully, but time passes, and humanity forgets their bravery and deeds, and only remembers the fact that they can't stand being in the same room as them because they are soulless, and thus, according to Ecclesiarchy doctrine, abominations, and thus the cycle of persecution begins all over again. Black Library has written about only two of these instances. The first was a few centuries after the end of the Horus Heresy. The sisters remained in hiding for over a thousand years, and were only brought back during the War of the Beast thanks to a direct appeal by the Primarch Vulcan himself. The second known revival of the Sisterhood is also its most recent. Following his resurrection, the restored Primarch Rebute Gilliman immediately called for the restoration of the Sisterhood, even giving them back the Somnus Citadel on Luna, ignoring the vociferous objections of both the Ecclesiarchy and the High Lords. Unsurprisingly, there is more than a little bitterness in the ranks of the Sisters of Silence. Bitterness towards an ungrateful humanity who time and again used them only to dispose of them when they were no longer needed. Still, with the Avenging Sun in their corner, it's unlikely that anyone within the Imperium will try to make a move on them. Gilliman may be a politician at heart, but he's unlikely to throw his most effective Chaos Fighters under the bus just to score some political gain. Still, while the sisters may be willing to serve, their willingness to trust is another matter entirely. There are simply too many wounds built up over 10,000 years for them to completely forget the past. Only time can heal such injuries, but as the Great Rift continues to expand and the threat of the Xenos grows ever stronger, 
it becomes increasingly doubtful if the sisters or the Imperium as a whole will have time to mend their broken fences.